Okay. Want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Absolutely. So I am not. Oh, I don't know. Uh, is that an echo for everyone? Okay. I'll move away from whatever's causing the echo. Um, so I'm not William Burns. So if you're here as a William Burns groupie, I will not be offended if you uh, go to the uh, doors. Um, William could not be here for the session, but he asked me to fill in. My name is Mike Gregory, and I'm the Director of Business Development for ILA. Um, and if you were at the uh, Master's Conference in Sacramento, you also saw that I substituted for someone. So I'm beginning to do a little bit of a cottage industry on filling in for people who can't make sessions. So if any of you are at SEALs and you want to spend time at the pool, I'm happy to go in and uh, fill in for your session. But my, my background is uh, I'm, of course, working for ILA. We're focused on distance education for law schools. We work with, full disclosure, Texas A&M, um, where William teaches. But... Uh, Prior to coming to Walters Clure, uh, to uh, ILA, I was at Walters Clure, the uh, legal publisher. So I have a background that's in more traditional forms of content, uh, coupled with the work that I'm doing now in distance education. And my name is John Mayer. I'm the executive director of CALI, the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. And um, basically, the, the the impetus for this session was uh, was a me was a message I sent out on the uh, Wiggle Dooley. I will explain that word in a second. Uh, discussion <laughs> list. Um, there, is, there is a working group of folks, working group on distance learning and legal education. It's, uh, it's, it's no more than an ad hoc group, but it's been around for, I'm not even sure, so it's like more, like five or six or seven years. Um, yeah, maybe I can actually show something here. Um, and they, were, they would originally get together once or twice um, uh, a year. Um, they they organ self organize themselves to write a book called um, uh, well let's pull up the book um, distance learning and well no I, I want to make sure I get the title correct distance learning and legal education design delivery and recommended practices so a group of about 50 60 people over over a couple of years wrote wrote this book on a collaborative basis. And um, I, I showed up sort of near the end of that process, attending their meetings, and said we would be happy to publish it, Cali. So we 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 wrestled it to the ground, sent a copy of this to every dean in the country. <coughs> this was about two or three years ago, but it's also available on our website for free uh, to to download. It's actually a pretty good and short, concise sort of you know the the state of thinking of what law schools were doing uh, about two or three years ago. Um, the discussion group uh, continues. It's at, uh, if you want to join it, the easiest way is just to send me an email and I'll add you to the Google group. Um, and we uh, post things at a website, uh, which is uh, wgdlle.org. Um, uh, that's too, too much of a mouthful, too many syllables, so I just call it wiggle dooley. Um, but, the, but the message I sent out was, you know, we should do a session that's distance learning, but not distance learning but, but all, the, all the types of different distance learning that might be possible in, in non-distance learning courses because the ABA allows you to do as much as a third of a course without calling it a distance learning course using distance learning technologies. Um, and it's a way for uh, law schools or legal or law professors to dip their toe into the, in, into the water, so to speak. Um, and, and also, um, the last distance, the, the, the session yesterday, Jack Graves said something that I thought was, that was almost like a perfect summation in one sentence. He said, you know, when you do distance learning, you have to track what the students, you have to f track the students more, more because you don't see them and, and you need to make sure that they're, they're, they're learning the material. And he said, and frankly, it should do a lot more of that in the, in the classroom as well. So, so in some ways, distance learning courses that do effective formative assessment or tracking are doing a better job at making sure that the students are, are learning their material. And, and so maybe this is a way to, uh, to explore that. So we got together a couple of people to talk about three different uh, approaches to that question, distance learning and non-distance learning courses. And the first one is uh, Chris, who's already introduced himself. But Chris, why don't you, uh, why don't you start? Great, thanks. Um, so I think one of the important things that you already mentioned, that as a contributor to that book, <laughs> one of the reasons we went with recommended practices instead of best practices in the title <laughs> is that there really are no best practices as yet. I mean, as far as distance ed is concerned, I mean, there, this is still kind of evolving. So we're all still trying to kind of figure out what the best, um, 
best methods for delivery and interaction actually are. Um, so my experience with this has been twofold. So I'll, I'll talk very briefly about both, and then we can kind of expand on it um, as, as you would like. Um, my experience with John Marshall overseeing some of the interactive elements that we've created um, in our hybrid courses and in our, in our online courses as well as some non-online courses. Um, what we tried to do is we tried to kind of sit down with instructors who, like you said, wanted to dip a toe in the water, weren't entirely sure of what they could do, um, which is fairly you know, common if this is not something that someone has experience in. Um, and basically just kind of say to them, you know, what, what elements of your current class would you like to see kind of more robustly explored? You know, if there's a specific discussion that you normally have in class, but it's something that kind of ends when, you know, the class ends and you'd like to keep that going, what elements like that exist so that we can maybe develop those out? And what we ended up with were a series of interactive lessons that we built in our learning management system, which is Moodle. And if you've used Moodle at all, you'll know that a lot of proprietary Moodle features are designed um, to be very flexible, and so it's kind of a nice environment for us to work in. And so our instructional designer and I would sit down with the individual instructors, and what we did was we identified a couple of courses that were not online where there was potential for some pretty complex uh, kind of scenario-based <laughs> Uh, lessons that we could build out almost in kind of a decision tree, like choose your own adventure style format. Um, and the reason that we did that was because the instructor basically said, look, so I posed this question in class, I posed this scenario, I have X number of people, you know, invariably raise their hands and say, well, here's what I think. Invariably, then some of those people are right, some of those people are maybe almost right, that sort of a thing. But the, the collaboration and, and the participation from the entire class wasn't really there in a way that this instructor wanted to see. And so what we did was we basically built this activity that ended up being pretty involved. We, we used a beta test group of students to kind of sit down with us and go through it um, to make sure that the elements were clear, to make sure that the choices were clear, all that sort of a thing. So it was a very collaborative project. When we were done, what we were left with was a scenario-based assessment of a problem that they would face, similar to something that they would face you know, in an actual assessment for the course, to basically walk students through a hypothetical scenario. And then instead of just saying, I think it's this, or I think it's this, and saying, yes, you're right, or no, you're wrong, let's move on, the instructor built videos into every step of the process that basically addressed the choices the students could have made. So let's say, you know, choice A was, yes, I think this is correct, but and choice B was no, and here's why I think it's wrong. Well, what happened is regardless of the way the student answered, whether they answered correctly or incorrectly, they would get a block of feedback then on the page that included a video from the instructor saying, yes, you're right, and here's exactly why. And then it would lead them to a new part of the scenario, so it would kind of build on what they had gotten correct before. Whereas if they got wrong, it would basically loop them back and say, no, here are the key elements of what you should have caught here. Now go back and think about how you answered and answer again, essentially. So basically it provided them the opportunities to fail and go back and look at what they didn't get right and then kind of piece things together on their own with some pre-recorded feedback from the instructor. And he made it a required piece of the course and it was very successful. Students liked it a lot and he found that he was able to then identify students who might not have spoken up in class or weren't speaking up in class you know, he was having students who then were doing really well on this and go to them and say, hey, you know, you did a really good job with this, and here's what I thought you did very well, which, you know, certainly gives a student who may not want to talk in class all the time a boost. Um, and for students who didn't do so well, he could sit down with them at midterm and say, hey, listen, here's the deal. Like, I looked at your answers here. Not that great. What's going on? You know, so it provided the instructor with a lot more opportunity based on just that one activity to get a sense of where students were in the course that he didn't have before. Uh, and that's a method that we've kind of pursued here at John Marshall with regard to our non-online courses. Um, in my own course development, uh, I recently uh, developed a hybrid course in uh, public speaking, uh, which admittedly is a strange course to have online in a lot of ways. Uh, but the way that I tried to frame that, you know, as I developed online components for it is, you know, so much of professional, tech professional work now has a technological element, what we're doing right now. 
Um, you know, we're not, I'm not sitting in a room with all of you, and this is fairly common in terms of the kinds of calls they might have to deal with uh, in a professional environment. Maybe they're dealing with web conferences, maybe, you know, some sort of, of, of conference call, with video incorporated, whatever it is. So the hybrid activities, I try to kind of bend that way uh, so that it's something we can complete in class, but it's also something that if the course was online, they could do online and we could discuss there as well. Um, one example of that was I had students at three different points in the term, I had them record themselves sort of as a self-assessment um, with a variety of different scenarios each time. In one case, you know, early on, just to kind of make it easy, you know, here's the scenario, you've been invited to a party, here are all the different variables you have to consider. Now I want you to record yourself leaving a voicemail for this person who's invited you and either accepting or not accepting and I want to hear how you respond basically. And the goal is to get them kind of evaluating the way that they spoke and the way that not just their tone, but their diction, the way that they presented information, the way that they chose to handle potentially sensitive situations, that sort of a thing. And then as the course progresses, you know, we kind of talk about those individual instances. So rather than throwing a bunch of quizzes and things like that, just as busy work, I wanted them to kind of think about, you know, the course is about being able to speak publicly and speak effectively. Here are all the ways in which you communicate on a daily basis that you may not even think about. Now go in and kind of assess the way that you're doing that. So far, it's been pretty successful, I would say. Students have certainly enjoyed it. It's been kind of a nice change of pace for me. Um, this summer will only be the second time that I've taught this course doing that. Um, so I'm still kind of tweaking that, that idea. Uh, but those are a couple of the examples of the hybrid activities that I've been involved in, in, in courses that were either partially online or not online courses with some extra tech elements involved. All right. Should we should we, <laughs> should we should we should we uh, take a few questions just at this point and then and then and then move on just so that we you know I always thought waiting for questions at the end you forget the first speaker any questions? It, it struck me that the first thing described sounded like a Cali lesson with videos. In, in many ways, it is similar to a yeah. lot of Cali lessons. Yeah, that's 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 not that's not too far out there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Moodle has a has a, a essentially an authoring or a, a question and answer um, authoring system built into it, right? I haven't looked yeah, at Moodle in a while. There are a couple of different options in Moodle for building out things like that. There's the, kind of your classic discussion forums and chat rooms, but then there's also this lesson feature that lets you kind of build out some sort of, of you know, multi-headed assessment, basically, however you want to. Cool. It, it actually, it, what, it, what it sounded like was um, uh, um, Roger Shank, who's, uh, who, who's, a, who's a, a giant in um, virtual, in uh, distance learning, at least he was until he retired. But, but the, way, the way he would build things is he would, uh, gr he would take a lot of video of an expert in an area, like uh, dozens of hours, and then he would, um, he would parse that video into three to five minute stories that the person was telling about particular situations and then build it into a scaffold where the user would would go through some go through a scenario and at various points the feedback would be the expert popping up and saying let me tell you a story about that's relevant to this particular situation um, uh, and, and so his, his his goal was to create uh, essentially expert uh, uh, you know, an, an expert video that wasn't just a, a TED talk or or an hour and a half video, but but punctuated by the by by the scenarios in which the learning in which the question pops into the learner's head, and then the expert is there right at that moment. It was uh, it had to be very uh, timely or or relevant to the to the point right at that moment. That's very similar to what we did. Yeah, that and that, and that was the goal ultimately. Um, the instructors who we have, you know, the ones that we have doing this so far, um, I think in every case that I can think of, I believe in every case. Um, these particular instructors were instructors who would have regular conferences with their students over the course of the term, just to kind of catch up with them and try to get an idea of, of kind of what their strengths and challenges are at that point. And that was very much the goal of the video piece, was to kind of provide some of that feedback that would apply to everyone in that format, so that when meeting time came, you know, that piece was kind of out of the way, and you could get a, a more in-depth look at kind of where they were you know, individually. 
We have often thought there should be a model for law professors or for all any any type of uh, thing. If you teach the same class uh, over and over, you sort of get the same questions over and over. Um, right. And and so why not record, you know, record that as a series of uh, small video FAQs that uh, that that either you make it available to the student if they can't make if they if they don't come in to see you, then they can see what all the answers you've given in the past to all the students who have ever asked the question. You know, it becomes a valuable um, um, archive of the types of things that uh, people frequently ask about the course. Of course, the first one would be, uh, it's in the syllabus. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good approach. I, I think you're right. I, and I try to do that to some extent in, in my own online courses. Um, like you say, I mean, certain subjects, you teach them enough times and, and it, it's very easy to kind of slip into this autopilot mode that you, you simply can't slip into online or students are going to fall through the cracks. Yep. All right. Great. You, you know, the, it's an interesting point. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about my probably first experience with a very rudimentary distance education, probably the same one that most of you had. Um, when you did bar review, um, and another full disclosure, my company is owned by Barbary, um, but I took Barbary, uh, and I took it, uh, and the first class I went to, I wanted to see Erwin Chemerinsky lecture. So I went to a massive lecture hall, and I sat there, I think in 30 rows back, and I realized that I could show up downtown uh, every day just to have absolutely no interaction with a great professor, or I could go to a hotel down the street, sit in a, a room, watch it. At that point, it was on videotape. Uh, so, you know, you, you really get that sense that, that we've experienced distance at its most rudimentary, at, at its least interactive. And distance has obviously come a lot further. I think you're here at Cali. Uh, you're not openly hostile to distance uh, or to technology. Uh, you're probably somewhere in the continuum from being agnostic to people who are true believers. So I, I think one of the things that um, William was going to talk about today, I'll focus on, is the effectiveness of distance education. Um, John mentioned uh, standard 306. The, uh, the standard has uh, both the current standard and what's going to happen in probably in August when the new standards uh, are voted on is that you have one, one rule that will continue in both uh, versions most likely and that's the one-third rule. So if you're under one-third distance you're not a distance course. So um, you, that's, a, that's a big change from a couple of years ago where the standard was 12 credits, no more than one, uh, four credits in a semester and very soon we're going to be at the one-third standard still in place, and then one-third fully online. So if you start adding the numbers, effectively you could have um, two-thirds of your program online without a variance. Uh, so the pressure is coming that distance education is getting, at least from the ABA level, more of a, uh, if not stamp of approval, at least not uh, any openly ho hostile approaches. More variances are getting approved. So I think that the, uh, the overall atmosphere lends itself to a discussion at our schools about is there a place for distance if we're not already doing it? And not just in the uh, LLMs or the masters or certificates, but is there a place in the JD programs? And I think more and more schools are doing the answer is yes. Uh, and how you, how you do that oftentimes is going through your faculty. And you're going to have questions about how effective is this? And you have a lot of people who were um, trained and uh, went to law school, like almost all of us, uh, in a world where Distance education was not a part of the uh, a part of the curriculum, so you're going to have a lot of uh, a lot of feedback uh, when you go in talking about the opportunities that are there in residential programs for group interaction, um, about how you can take a, take a real read of the room better if you're in the online uh, the residential setting. So you have people who will question the effectiveness. Um, there are a lot of studies out there that you can point to. Unfortunately, most of them are not law school focused. But there are a lot of studies out there about effectiveness of legal education um, and generally education done in an online setting. One of the things that, um, that I would focus on is the fact that complementing a residential effort, uh, each has its strengths and each has its weaknesses. If, if you think about uh, an analogy I like is uh, the Southwest effect, that when Southwest typically comes into a, a new city, 
it has an impact on other airlines. Uh, if you're a consumer, it has an impact for the better. Uh, and it's not just pricing, but other airlines need to step up their game in a number of different ways if they're competing with Southwest or with JetBlue or any of the uh, uh, low-cost carriers. So I think about that with residential. Uh, a lot of what online does is informed by the best of residential, but online takes it to a couple of new levels that can't be done as effectively in the classroom. Um, certainly, we've got a convenience factor that you've got students who are out there in the uh, in the world taking uh, classes uh, in the residential setting where they're coming into a physical location, and you've got a convenience factor of uh, someone who will be on a on a job while they're trying to juggle their education. I mean, that's that's a logical, easy one. But I think you've got some other things about how you can have student collaborations uh, effectively in an online setting, whether you're using Zoom or Blackboard Collaborate or other elements, you have the ability to gather the students together. So for each element of what happens here in the physical classroom, there, there is an analogous effort you can make in the online setting, co both complementing what you're doing in the uh, residential classes, but also, I think, in a, in a unique way, replacing what's not, um, not done well in the online classes. So, Getting here at the podium, speaking for an hour, speaking for 50 minutes, can be done in a flipped classroom mode with online, uh, an online class. You can do that, and then you have more interactive elements with the student, whether they're residential, whether they're online, that I think can make the case for getting uh, more online classes within your JD program. Um, you know, there, there's learning outcomes, uh, and learning outcomes are interesting because uh, law schools, compared to a lot of uh, a lot of higher education, were a little late to the game as far as putting it into standards. But you've got uh, got learning outcomes where we all say that that the learning outcomes are, are things we pay attention to in the residential setting, and and a lot of people do. But I've heard some uh, some schools where they say, well. No, we, we try to show a couple of examples here or there where we're showing what actual outcomes are, and then we repeat it for every class. That, that's not really effective learning outcomes. What you've, what you've got in the online setting is something, as Chris talked about, you've got the ability to measure in much more significant ways what students are doing. And if people are believing that learning outcomes should be the ultimate end goal of what you're doing within an education environment, Online has a nice complement to residential in giving you something that's not only uh, saying we're matching up this we're doing in the online setting to this outcome, but showing how the students are performing against that outcome. Um, you can do that in uh, residential. There's more subjectivity, I think, to doing that in the residential setting. You can do it in certainly in measurable ways in the uh, online space. Uh, and that, that's important also when you get to um, occupational outcomes. So for a lot of students, they're going out into the world where they're, they're not measured on thinking like a lawyer. They're measured on actual outcomes, whether their job is working in a law firm or they're doing something that is uh, JD preferred. You've really got a, a sense of students having a different world out there where outcomes are concerned when they get into the real world versus what they typically are seeing in law schools. I think the online setting brings them a little bit closer to what they'll see once they get out in practice. Um, and Chris was mentioning also the, uh, the, the fact that you have a lot, of, uh, a lot of the interactivity that happens today being done like we're doing on Skype. Um, so for students who come from an environment where all they're doing is 86, 90 credits of sitting in the classroom, uh, that's not what practice is going to be like. For students who are taking a dispute resolution class and they're sitting there in the classroom for the entire three credits um, and the shock of online dispute resolution, once they get in there, they find a lot of things are done online. Or if they're taking contracts or to taking sales, they find out that you're spending half your time redlining documents, shifting them back and forth. So a lot of things... Uh, that go to the effectiveness of online complementing the residential can also be tied back to what students see in the practice of law. Um, and then you've got the tools that are available in online learning. I wouldn't focus as much on the tools themselves. So you, you've got a lot of things you can do. I'm going to show you a, a clip from Texas A&M's program where we use an avatar. And it's, it's cool. It looks neat. You, you may you actually think it doesn't look that uh, professional. but um, it, we're really that that's neutral. That that color we chose is because A and M's colors are there. Uh, the avatar is because the professor didn't want to appear on video. So th there were reasons we did this, but they don't go to learning effectiveness. What really goes to learning effectiveness is back to outcomes, back to seeing how we can measure what the students are doing. So I think uh, you know, if, I'll play you two minutes just of this clip, and this is George Mentz at uh, Texas A and M.
Welcome everybody, my name is George Bitts, and this is the Financial Planning Course. It's part of the Master Blog Program at Texas A&M University School School Programs. I'd like to welcome all of you personally here today. We'll be discussing the basics of financial planning. I want to begin by saying, roughly in the late 90s in the United States, there were three main areas of financial planning concern. The first was your banking, the second was your investments, and the, sec uh, the third was the insurance or risk management part of your financial planning. What happened in the late 1990s is the Glass-Steagall Act was repealed. And what that did was that allowed investments and banking and insurance to be combined and it can be offered in a one-stop shop format from a financial firm. I think that that's good. It gives you now, give you just a quick quick sense. But again, the medium is is what it is. It, it, we're doing uh, <laughs> classes where it's all video. We're doing classes where there's avatars. We're doing classes where there's something that looks more like Khan Academy. Um, but the medium really is effective in how you use it as a student. The fact that this is online has a convenience factor for students. Um, and that has a real impact on how they uh, gel with the class, uh, understand the topic area. So you give them more control over their education, you also tend to see better outcomes. And that, that's a key factor where I mentioned we're, we're kind of agnostic as far as the look and the feel will rely a lot on the, what the school wants. Um, and that's really because we don't see that this color change or we change from an avatar to a video is going to make a huge amount of difference. Um, the fact we have a start and stop makes much more difference. The fact that there are discussion boards, uh, the fact that there are assessments that can be measured that are baked in. Things that also can be done uh, in the residential classroom. But those are the things that really, I think, make the difference where you can make the case that complementing a residential program with an online uh, can increase your value for the education environment overall and not just uh, let's do online because the ABA is increasing their hours. So happy to um, just answer any uh, questions, uh, talk a little bit more and interested to hear also about what you're seeing for effectiveness if you've already got programs, especially in the JD space, that are up and running. Uh, yes? Just a quick question, what program is that one in? Uh, what, the platform? Yeah. It's on, it's on Blackboard. Uh, yeah. yeah. And we also, uh, there's, a, there's a live environment there. So Blackboard Collaborate um, is, and we don't have the live environment up and running there, but, um, but for small group sessions, for office hours, for other things where you're getting a live environment, um, the, the key there is replicating what you can do in the classroom, um, but getting students who are at disparate points uh, coming together. So having the ability to whiteboard things, bring in documents, other things that, that for technology is a fairly easy thing to do, but the convenience factor on top of that is sometimes what you don't get in the residential setting. Questions, comments? What are you doing at your school? Ray? Uh, I just wanted to emphasize, you talked about sort of the using the videos to lead up to the classroom and to prepare students for what you're going to do in the classroom and the group work. It's certainly, I find that helpful. I also, I, I use videos in a large format civil procedure class that I teach. And the students report that, yes, it's helpful to them to prep, but they also go back and watch the videos. And I, you know, I can see, uh, you know, on our metrics, students are watching the videos three, four, five times particularly as we get ready for midterms, as we get ready for the final, and then we're, we put the videos, we make the videos available to students as they're studying for the bar as well. So that stuff lives on, you, students can go back to it as many times as they want. Uh, I, I, they, students report that that's really helpful uh, for, for them. So that's another aspect. It doesn't just prep people for when they're in the classroom, but it gets them, you know, helps them later on as well. Sure, that's a great point. The reinforcement uh, and the prep for exams. Sure. My turn. All right. Um, so, well, uh, I want to show you some stuff that's that 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 uh, many of you already be familiar with with Kelly, but I also want to do um, sort of make a, a larger observation. Um, more and more. Um, the whole idea of distance learning is just learning. 
In other words, the, the distance part is, is disappearing in the sense that it's baked into other to things. And we're not looking at it as two different, two different places or spaces or even head spaces. And, and I have a series of examples that, I, that, I, that sort of all just popped into my head at once. Um, the first one is, you know, uh, you, you all use Facebook, right? Or you know what Facebook is. Um, uh, in the last week, I've noticed that a lot of my friends or people that I'm on Facebook with uh, have started to use Facebook Live. And that there's even a small group of them, I wasn't participating, in which at a certain time, they'll, they'll click on Facebook Live and they'll cook together. Which is to say, they'll do their preparation, all, built, all making the same dish, but at their, at their local location. And they can use Facebook Live to show each other what ingredients they're using or what the, what the dishes look or something like that. You know, it's kind of like it's, 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 uh, it's sharing, but it's also learning. Second thing is, do you all know what Slack is? Anybody not know what Slack is? So Slack is a community message board, but it's a corporate community message board. Um, uh, at Cali, we're, we're on it all the time. And the main reason we use it is so that we don't email each other because our email streams are noisy and chaotic and we can't organize them. With Slack, we can create channels that are project-based um, or, and I can even create ad hoc groups that are like just me, uh, me and the technical people or me and the content people or me and uh, the consultants or, or things like that. So it started out just as a message board where you leave messages for people and they'll pop up or you can, but you can turn off notifications. And then they started to add things like if there's a group of people that are in a particular channel, so we're all talking about uh, Cali Author or we're all talking about uh, um, um, lessons, I can click on literally one button and it will call them Skype-like and everybody will, uh, with audio only, although video is available, but we don't need it, audio only will be on a conference call and we can then uh, talk to each other. And so even though I've got six employees in Chicago, two in Atlanta, one in Minnesota, one in Florida, and the ones in Chicago aren't always in the office, they're working from home, um, I can immediately conference call people effortlessly while we're all online. And I don't even think about it now, about the fact that some of them are a thousand miles away and some of them are 20 feet away. Um, and, and uh, you know, and I have that sort of fluidity of, of, of connection. Uh, Slack is uh, adding more and more features to this. Uh, one of them is screen sharing. And then on top of that screen sharing, they're adding things like keyboard control. So if there's a group of programmers all talking about how, you know, a bug in a program, the project manager might be saying, here's what's going on. And then the programmer says, well, I'm going to open up the JavaScript console. And then one of the other programmers is going to say, well, let me take over the keyboard and try a few things. And then they do that in front of everybody else. And problems go from, this is a mess, to here's what it looks like, to I think I've got the solution, to, you know, okay, we're done. You know, the speed of interaction becomes uh, a, little, a, little, a little scary and dizzying. My point is, these are all tools that are just getting baked in to existing um, uh, business corporate tools, oh, wait, wait, uh, and, and, and yet they are certainly would be available in, in distance learning, what we previously called distance learning type situations. I'll add two more points to that. One of them is all of these work on our PCs or our laptops, and they all work on our mobile devices as well. So sometimes people are not at their computer, but they can still pull up the app and interact almost all the interactions the same way. Obviously, you know, being able to see a screen of code on, a, on, a, on, a, on an iPhone is a little bit difficult. Um, the last one is uh, something that you, should, that, that, that you are all familiar with, and that's Google Docs. I don't know how many times we say, well, we got to like draft up something. It used to be I would, uh, I would do it or somebody else would do it, and then they would email around the copy. Instead, we, we default start with Google Docs. People jump in. Uh, there's a there's a rapid you do this part you do this part you do this part you can literally see the the document grow in front of you with three different people typing you know the outline and, and things like that and so it becomes instant collaborative authoring all those all all this is to say is that the the, the things that we used to call distance learning technology disappears into just the technology that makes communication at a distance uh, uh, effortless. Uh, I think it was a Clay Shirky who said, you know, social technology doesn't get interesting until it disappears, you know, and, and that's what's happening, I believe, in this. I think to speak to that, John, if I can cut in real quick, I mean, I, the other thing we try to stress to our faculty here who are kind of reluctant to, to start this process or 
you know, kind of experiment with it is that, you know, virtually all students are coming into grad school now <coughs> that this will be part of it. You know, I mean, so many students now, I mean, I don't, I don't know if the, I have to do the math on the age issue, but um, there was an article not long ago I read, and I, I thought it was the Chronicle, talking about how, you know, most students, the vast majority of students now coming into higher ed have never known a world without social media. So you're, you're looking at students who are no longer coming into college, into higher ed, into grad school, thinking this is a novelty. They're expecting that this will be part of the environment they're walking into. Sure. All right. So the things that I was going to uh, TLDR uh, too long to read about was, and, and, and I'm going to go rapidly through these things, are uh, Cali Lessons, Lesson Link, Auto Publish, QuizWrite, and Lesson Live, which, which, um, uh, which is basically um, uh, Cali Lessons are the, uh, the original flipped classroom. I mean, the idea behind them back in 1978 or 82 and, and so on was that you could send your students off to run these doctrine tutorials, um, and then maybe you didn't have to cover that material, or at least the, the, when you did cover it in the class, then they were getting a second bite at, bite at the apple. Um, I, 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 I always forget that, that there's a thousand of those lessons and that people don't realize that we have them covering 40 different subject areas. And that's different from, uh, what was it? I, I was on Reddit, somebody, was say, somebody said something bad about a Cali lesson. I, I, I monitor social media for commentary about us. And it was a law professor, and I jumped on and I said, so when was the last time you looked at a Cali lesson? And, uh, by the way, I'm the executive director of Cali, <laughs> um, and and he, and he said, "Oh well, actually, I haven't looked at him in ten years. You know, do you have? Are there any new ones?" You know, and I'm like, uh, "Yeah, about 800 new ones since ten years ago." So, um, you know, they're they're used over 600,000 times a year. They are they the students. Most of our usage is from students finding them themselves. A great amount of usage right before final exams, but they're best used when they're slotted into an existing curriculum or syllabus by uh, law professors who say, you know, here's some things. I'll, I'll assign one and recommend the rest, or suggest that you at least look at them. So, you know, make use of them. Um, now, Lesson Link is a feature of uh, of Cali Lessons where. Uh, no, let me let me be, let me back up and, and uh, come back at that. So when students run Cali lessons, they get a score. Um, the score they can see, and they can run Cali lessons multiple times, increase their score, gamification such as that. Um, but faculty don't get to see that score. Now, if you want to see the score, or you want to assign Cali lessons to students and see the score, we have a feature called Lesson Link. It creates a permanent URL that you then hand out to your class or put in the twin or stick on your um, uh, course management system. And then when the student runs the lesson, you get to see the results of that. Right? Um, what what you get is a dashboard on your on your on your on your Cali account that will show the number of times it has been run, and you can either download all a whole bunch of information about the students' runs of those lessons into a spreadsheet and do what you want with it, or we have a series of of uh, reports that could be run that show you how well or poorly those students did. Let me uh, pull up a couple of those. So and, and all I've got is yeah, yeah. I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna go quick rather than rather than try to like go deep into this and fumble about. So so the the reports will show things like the list of students who took a particular lesson and it's expanding it expands and collapse and it will show uh, percentages of right and wrong on those things. The report also will show the, the lesson itself and the questions that you can sort by which questions everybody did very well on down to which questions people, you know, a lot of people are having trouble with. So hopefully this is a situation where you see, well, it looks like they're not doing so well on these questions on the bottom. Maybe that's something I should bring up for discussion in class, you know, whereas the, the questions, the topics that are being covered by the ones at the top where everybody did well, maybe that's something that I can be uh, rest assured that people did did good enough for me to continue on with, all right? Oops. So another angle on this is um, I've never met a law professor who will take 
what another law professor has written and deliver it without commentary to their students as uh, as gospel. Um, if they give, if you give them the, the the opportunity to add commentary or change or or adjust the the message, um, they will they will they will be they're more happy that way. And so so we built that into it. Auto publish is a feature of a of a piece of software called Cali Author. You can download and install Cali Author, and then if you uh, talk to us, we'll let you download existing lessons and make changes to them. Um, and then you can press a button that publishes that lesson back to our website and then gives you a permanent URL that you can hand to your students. So up will pop the, uh, the feedback that the author of the lesson said, and then there's your feedback right below it saying, I'm not sure I agree with Professor Nor Garland. He's, he, he must have been smoking something when he wrote this lesson. So auto publish is our way of letting you take our existing materials and make smaller great adjustments. And by the way, if you don't even like, if you don't like about, if we don't have a lesson in that space, or you want to do substantial changes to it, you can use Cali Alpha to write your own lessons and click the auto publish button. All right. Um, I'm going to skip quiz right for just a second and go to lesson live um, because it's it's a it's a it was intended as a as an in classroom tool, but it could be used in a distance learning situation, which is uh, well. Let me explain. So, so Lesson Live is um, is the ability is the ability to run a lesson on your computer. So you you the faculty run a lesson on your computer. You create a lesson link for it, which the students then run. And if you're both doing this at the same time, which is to say in the classroom, or if you're doing this at the same time because everybody's online, um, but let me let me take the classroom example. First. <coughs> so so the, the faculty who's running in the classroom could be de could be showing the lesson, and this would this is what would appear to the students. You'll notice that the there's three students logged in or running this lesson right now at the same time as this faculty member, but they're identified as student one, two, and three with a little checkbox that basically says, do you want to show the names, right? So sometimes you want to do this in an anonymous way um, because you don't want to embarrass the students if they get something wrong or for whatever pedagogical reasons. Or maybe you want to click on reveal names um, and it will bug you, you know, are you sure? Because you're going to about to show this to everybody. And if you say yes, then it will display the students' names. At this point, the students can answer the questions on their version of the lesson, and the faculty member basically gets a dashboard that changes based on each question, showing how the students did on that question. So in this example here, I've got, a, I've got the question, I've got the answers, I, I, I got an overall that says 29% got it uh, correct, that's that 2 out of 7. And over on the far right, uh, the red students are the ones that got it wrong. The green students are the ones who, who, who got it correct. And so if you are in a classroom situation, that's an opportunity to say, whoa, five of you got it wrong. Maybe we should talk about this. You know, whereas if everybody gets it right, then that's, a, that's an indication that uh, people are doing well. Time to move on. All right? It's kind of like clickers and Cali lessons. I mean, it's sort of what we were going for was software-based you know, clickers, but but in context of uh, of a of a multiple choice question uh, uh, display system, um, the same thing would work. By the way, if the faculty member were sitting there, actually, the faculty member can assign the lesson with the lesson links. The students can go run it, and then the faculty member can come back after the students have run the lesson, and they would basically see this, and so it becomes like literally a screen by screen uh, reporting system back to the faculty member. Um, if they're inside the lesson at this point, they can click on a button called Lesson Past, which is like, to say, a time machine. I'm going to look at, I'm going to see how everybody did. And then they're taken to the, to the analysis or the, the reports that shows you know, how the students did on this particular lesson, right, wrong, things like that. <clears throat> it's really hard to demo this. Because there's like lots of because I have to I have to show you like how, what the student sees what the faculty sees and things like that and so it's much better I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna figure out a way to do a really perfect video of this someday but it's uh, really best to sort of like try it out for yourselves and um, and we're still iterating on the uh, on the interface to make this uh, make this work last thing I want to talk about is Quizrite um, 
So the problem with tally lessons is they were designed to teach. They weren't really designed for formative assessment. They can be used in that way. But they, but they, are, they tend to be pretty wordy. There's a long hypos with uh, multiple follow-up questions. You know, they're not built for the, the, the quiz environment or the, even sometimes the classroom environment. Um, and Kelly Author is a pretty complicated piece of software to learn. Not too bad. Not bad at all. All right, not bad at all. Yeah. Um, but we wanted something like even simpler. So, so, we've, so we've been working on, a, on, on something called QuizWrite. It's entirely uh, web-based. Um, and, it, and it rests upon the ecology and the infrastructure that is Lesson Live, Lesson Link, AutoPublish, and uh, Kelly, Kelly Author. And all it is is a way to uh, edit, to, to uh, author multiple choice questions. Um, all the same things apply, though. You can create a quiz and then auto-publish it and then play it live where you see the, 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 how the students are doing in, in, uh, in near real time. There's not much to show as far as uh, you know, how it works. It's, uh, it's, it's boxes where you type uh, questions and answers into. Um, you 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 can tag the questions with uh, some kind of um, at this point a, a fairly simple one of the forty topics that uh, of law that you might be teaching in, um, but the whole thing runs in that same infrastructure you know that I did, that I just talked about um, where you can reveal how well people are doing so potentials for formative assessment there either in the classroom or offline or real time at a distance. Our goals for QuizWrite, you know, is to make it really easy to do formative assessment. You know, you can do it a five-question quizzes. It won't take you an hour or, or, or so to, to write them. You write them, you can write them 10 minutes before class, just based on what was taught that week and, and, and do sort of a gut check on how well uh, the students are doing. Like I said, built on all these other technologies. There's no software to install. We're thinking about how about some sort of model that lets students write their own quiz questions for themselves. How about then them being able to share those questions between and among themselves? Um, the software is open source. If you wanted to install it on your own servers at your law school or something like that, we'd be happy to uh, let you do that. Um, uh, I talked about the, the classroom use case, uh, the synchronous distance learning use case, and the asynchronous distance learning use case, so I've already covered that. But the, 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 we're, we're trying to lay a, a platform here for question banks, um, which is to say what we really, what legal education needs is about 100,000 multiple choice questions that faculty and students taxonomy tagged so that they could say, I'm having trouble with adverse possession, you know, or, or you know, not, not just property, not just torts, but something down the, down the, uh, the taxonomy, and I would like 10 or 15 questions to quiz myself on. Or a faculty member might like to say, I'm going to pluck out a few of these questions and throw them at my students to see how they're doing, you know, as, a, as, a, and as an exam review. And even the ability for schools to build their own uh, exam banks if they want to do that. Towards that, we're in the process of culling through our 25,000 multiple choice questions that exist inside of Cali Lessons. Like I said, some of them aren't very good for this type of thing because they're too long. Um, some of them, uh, you know, are, are, are uh, we have to do some curating, let, let's put it that way, as a, as a way to seed the bank or uh, to, to seed the pump of the of multiple choice questions that might be available in a, in a quiz write uh, thing. So our big picture is to avoid, avoid the problem that's been happening in the past of silos. Um, if you sell access to multiple choice questions, you have to hide them from, from people for multiple reasons. One, because they can be reused over and over. Two, because um, they might be uh, digital rights managed so they can continue to extract uh, um, subscriptions for them. Um, I want to sort of give them away and make them a community resource. You know, um, I think that for student, for faculty, uh, formative assessment and learning how to do it effectively is a muscle that they need to uh, exercise with, and that faculty are on a learning curve of how best to use this with this new technological uh, environment that we're in, and the tools need to be open and flexible. Um, and, and like I said, there is this access control dilemma. Um, students. You know, when you give students a test, one of the, the first questions they'll ask afterwards is, can I have a copy of it? Because I want to study it to see what I did wrong. And that seems like a reasonable and educational 
sort of approach. Um, but the student faculty might want to keep them secret because they want to use them in the next semester. And so um, I, I'll leave that open as a discussion question as to, as to how, you, how you deal with that. Um, and and that's, that's what I've got to say there. Norm. Well, it's funny you bring all this up <coughs> because uh, last year, I can't remember which semester, for the first time I was doing an online uh, hybrid of criminal procedure that required me to meet our formative assessment requirements at our school by creating a much different final exam for multiple choice questions. So I decided before the semester began that I was going to pi pirate the Cali lessons <laughs> on criminal procedure. And I called Deb and I said, do you mind if I do this? She said, absolutely, go ahead. So I poured over all of the lessons that were pertinent to the course topics that I was covering. And I slaved over it. And I created a wonderful set of multiple choice questions to administer to the class as the final exam. I then spent the entire semester pushing them to do Cali lessons. And I kept saying, it'll pay off for you in ways that you can't even imagine. <laughs> and so uh, I gave the, the exam. And like two of the students recognized that what it was. They aced it. And they stopped me in the hall or came to my office and said, you know, that was a wonderful experience. And I said to myself, you know, I don't care if the word gets out that this is what the final exam multiple choice questions are based on. I don't need to worry about it because what they'll do is do the Cali lessons, which is what I wanted them to do in the first place. So I'm confident that I'm going to continue using the same bank of questions, and I'm not worried about it. Cool. Yeah, we, it's not a terrible thing when your students uh, learn the material. Exactly. It's based on a long-standing theory that you can't tell them too much. Right. <laughs> well, well, my, well, well, my theory is if, if there's enough questions in the bank on any on, on, on uh, for every topic, <laughs> then you know the way the students would uh, would would cheat is to memorize the answers to thousands of questions. Well, if you can get your students to memorize the answers to thousands of questions, then it's not cheating anymore. Exactly. It's learning. That's maybe an oversimplification, but. Questions, comments? It's the end of the day. One more session. <laughs> and then the raffle. The raffle's fixed. I wouldn't even bother going. <laughs> <laughs> I got my eyes on that Monier hammer toolbox. <laughs> no, no. And then the raffle, yeah. All right. Do you, any of you guys uh, use uh, any distance learning in your non-distance learning courses right now? We use WebEx um, largely because our classroom is a long, skinny classroom. So <laughs> the students in the back, <laughs> the back <laughs> have a hard time. I mean, we, have a, you know, we have a full screen projector, but when you're trying to do demos of um, different platforms, it gets really hard. So we have we use WebEx as just a way to do a repeater for on their on their screens. Oh my gosh, that's hilarious! Distance education, <laughs> yeah, so very very <laughs> low distance education. Ray, you had your hand up. Yeah. Um, so we have we we work on Canvas, not on Blackboard. We do some. We use Panopto. I don't know if anyone uses Panopto. I did some training with Video Scribe. I did some videos with Video Scribe. I don't know if anyone has ever used that. Can you briefly describe what it does? It, well, it, it sort of makes it look like you know the UPS guy in front of the blackboard. It like it you you tell it so you give it like a PowerPoint basically, and it has a hand come in and write out the oh, oh yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, the, the either the what the PowerPoint is so it's it's writing it out so it sees a hand and you can choose the flesh color of the hand and all this stuff. Um, and then it does the same with you, if you put a graphic up, it sort of draws the graphic in. So it's, it's animated, sort of, um, but it's, 
it, I found it really hard to use, so I moved away from Video Scribe. I mean, I was doing for a 10 minute video, it might be five hours to make it. It was really difficult. Uh, and, and we also use just voice over PowerPoint. So, and Panopto is kind of like voice over PowerPoint, and that's, that's what I find to be most comfortable. Anybody else using uh, distance learning in their non distance learning course? One more? Yeah, but it's really, for me, it's really different. So I teach a clinic, and I have a sort of rapid turnaround trial practice couple, coupled with an appellate practice as the clinic, which means I'm going to cancel a lot of classes. So hmm. I've been trying to put together podcasts which capture the appellate case files because, you know, sort of once they're done, they're done, and it's not necessarily a learning tool for the students unless you take some effort to make it a learning tool for the students because they have new cases and they're moving forward. Mm -hmm. So I've tried to put together podcasts, but one of the things that interests me about so much of what's out there and available is it really isn't tailored to practice environment, tailored to the lecture environment. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I was just thinking about how to test completion, right? Because I don't care about whether they learn specific content from having read the briefs and done the podcast. Because the podcasts are coupled with the briefs and the transcripts um, from the cases. Yeah, so it's sort of like my little story about it that they get to read and see what we did. So I was thinking about having an interactive module where they have to sort of identify what they would have done differently with the brief, like sort of a critique. To try to build that, it's just interesting to me because it's all very targeted towards teaching lecture, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, there, there's some interesting things I've seen where they they're simulations where you can build in that that environment of whatever you're trying to show works a lot better in skills areas than doctrinal but uh, but that's one uh, kind of on a continuum from really flat lecture to very interactive live environment uh, you can look at uh, possibly doing something like that or the live setting I was talking about where you gather students in small groups say like we would hear you could say okay you're in this room you're in this room but you have the digital room and the instructor can bounce back and forth between them. Chris, any last words? Uh, nothing in particular. I mean, I'm uh, happy to answer questions, you know, via email or, you know, continue the conversation with anyone who would like to. But, yeah, I mean, just to kind of speak to, to your points and everyone's points kind of as a whole, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think your, your kind of summation that the distance part of this is gradually going away is, is kind of the right note to end on. I mean, this stuff was so novel at one point, and, you know, it's like you can't go to any conference with, with any sort of online education bent without seeing 10,000 vendors, you know, you know, all selling different, you know, similar products. But I think ultimately, at the end of the day, kind of cutting through all that, you know, schools finding the best tools for them and, you know, instructors finding the best tools for them individually is really the most important part of this. Um, and the instructor element, I think, is, is by far, you know, the most valuable piece in all this. And I think sometimes it's lost. I mean, you know, there's so much talk of, of the tool, and there's so much talk of, you know, the cool things that this device can do or that this kind of software can do. But ultimately, those things are useless without an instructor who knows what they want to communicate and, and ultimately has an outcome in mind. I mean, if you have that, you can use anything to get where you want to be. Um, and I think, you know, once... Once we've been able to effectively communicate that through example um, to our instructors, it's been, you know, that, that's been probably the most important takeaway. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.